All right, welcome back uh, to session four. This is our second panel of the day. And this one lo loosely focuses on the question, what are the consequences for society at large? Our panelists in this session will be Lauren Bennett, Program Manager of Spatial Analysis and Data Science at ESRI and a co-organizer of today's event. Um, Iona Dada, who is not currently here, but we're trying to bring her on, who's human, oh, he's a professor of human geography at the University of College London. Steph de Sabata, Associate Professor of Geographical Information Science at the University of Leicester. Fyodor Jankowski, Professor of Geography at San Diego State University. Gung Chen Mai, Assistant Professor in the Geography Department of Geography at the University of Georgia. Giovanna Rosen, Assistant Professor of Public Policy at Rutgers University, Camden. And the moderator of this panel will be Jeremy Crampton, Professor of Urban Data Analysis at Newcastle University and a co-organizer of this event. So Jeremy, the floor is yours. Thank you and welcome everybody. The title of this session is What are the Consequences for Society at Large? And we've got about 40 minutes to solve that problem. <laughs> of course, <laughs> we're not going to be able to do that, but fortunately, I'd just like to remind everybody that this is a kickoff webinar, and we'll be having further events uh, in the future. And also, we might not be able to get to all of your questions that you may post in the Q&A, uh, but uh, if we don't actually manage to address them live, um, there may be a possibility for people to type in a response as well. So I encourage you to pop some, some questions uh, into the Q&A. Um, a couple of orientations. I asked the panelists um, to treat this panel in the tradition of the, the red team. And for those unfamiliar, the idea of the red team is that they look for vulnerabilities or weaknesses, dangers, uh, maybe barriers, that may exist in a product or a practice or any kind of innovation that uh, may be about to be released, ideally before it's released, but um, not necessarily always. That was the first uh, sort of orientation. And then secondly, I asked panelists to consider chat GPT as, as broadly as they like, to include a, a generative and especially a geo-foundational machine learning. So we're particularly interested, in other words, in its relation or its production of geographies, either actually existing or uh, feel free to speculate as well. And then finally, the word consequences in the title, you can read these as either desirable uh, or undesirable, um, or perhaps even desirable for some folks, uh, but uh, not for others. So I'm going to I'm going to start with a kind of a baseline question. If you if you would um, each take a take a shot at this one, and it's simply to uh, ask you whether you're frightened or excited by the seeming rise of Chat GPT and, and, and AI. In other words, what is for you the the biggest consequence uh, for society? Okay, well, I'll go. <laughs> um, I, you know, I my overarching feeling is optimism um, that there is a lot of potential and opportunity for progress, and you know, it's change is hard and can be scary and isn't always positive, and there I, I believe will be negative consequences as well. So I guess I'd probably say if I had to put it really succinctly, it would be I'm like skeptically optimistic. Um, I think that the there are some areas that are just like slam dunk obvious positives for our field. You know, I think that there are some problems that these models, these like, let's say very generically foundation models, large language, also more computer vision probably the computer vision is the the most obvious slam dunk stuff, I think, as compared to some of the large language model stuff. Um, but I think that there's um, 
a lot of opportunity. And I think that, and, and I think some of that opportunity is in our ability as geographers to um, collaborate. I think that one of our greatest strengths as a field is how interdisciplinary we are and how interdisciplinarily we think about the world. Um, and I think that that gives us a huge reason to be really deeply involved in what the future of building out these models looks like so that we can build in the that lens that we see the world with into these models, which I think will make them infinitely more useful to society and the future. I, I think I'm uh, going to give a sort of like a dual answer, but more or less like Lauren did. Um, I'm both concerned and sort of like amazed about these new developments. I'm concerned because well, many of the panelists in the, in the previous panel have talked about many of the ethical and practical issues around these models. And there is a lot of problems, both sort of like upstream in how these models have been developed in terms of the biases in data, uh, but also uh, something that maybe is not as taught much um, in terms of the working condition of some of the people that actually work on these models, especially when it comes to content moderation um, and also downstream, sort of like, again, bias in, bias out in a way, but also, you know, thinking in terms of geography and in terms of the impact and consequences of society at large, what are the sort of like the impacts on the job market and what would be the sort of like the geographies of the impact on the job market. Uh, and I guess there is a sort of like a sideways impact, which is also how much all of these models will suck the air out from a lot of NLP research and, you know, all the research that has been done in geographic information retrieval and NLP in geography in terms of, you know, oh, well, this problem has been solved. Why should I give you a grant to do this kind of research? Uh, but I'm also amazed in terms of the kind of, about this model, what they can do. And I found it absolutely astonishing that, you know, they can produce seemingly you know, meaningful content without uh, actually understanding or knowing anything. The fact that they can just produce uh, this seemingly human content is just fascinating, amazing. It raises also, I think, a lot of questions about language itself uh, and, you know, maybe tackle, sort of like change a little bit our prospecting what we understand as language and the role of language in human society. Well, let me take a crack of this. <laughs> uh, not so, uh, I think like everybody else, I, I see a positive and negative. I'm going to focus on one specific aspect and that is in uh, supporting choice making. Decision support has been my area of interest for many, many years. So I've been looking at uh, these models and the tools that result from this specific standpoint, how effective they may be in supporting uh, choice making and supporting more complex decisions and focusing on a simple relatively simple issue of choice making at an individual level. It was a positive, of course, that I see uh, uh, that maybe not in this rendition of the tools that we see, but in the future renditions, it, it can be quite effective in uh, providing an individual or even a group of uh, you know, people with uh, more co complete information. Uh, that's one of the basic tenets of uh, rational decision-making, why people make irrational decisions. Well, some theoreticians have claimed for a long time they make irrational decisions because they do not have complete information. So in the absence of complete information, you can only make suboptimal or sometimes irrational decisions. So that can be amended by these tools, by uh, giving us more complete body of organized data and information, and therefore help us make better choices. But there is a downside of this that I see. If and when these tools 
get good enough that we become complacent in trusting them, what they recommend us, we may be misled. And even worse, we may cede our agency to those tools. Essentially, we may, you know, outsource making choices and in some instances making important decisions to these tools. And by that, we will basically giving up our freedom of choice. I mean, for anybody who has done uh, any you know, reading or any work with in, in the decision support, it's obvious that these tools are not meant to make decisions for us. They are basically meant to help us make decisions, right? We are the ultimate deciders, we, humans. So uh, I see a potential danger in, uh, again, not now, later on, uh, once this evolves, becomes better, more effective in us ceding that agency, that freedom. And uh, uh, I don't, and I'm not sure we, we're going to be happy with that down the road. So that, that, that's my point. So um, for me, uh, same to the previous panelists, I also have a mixed feelings. Um, from the positive side, um, because my research is more on GOA and geographic question answering, so uh, it is very uh, excited to see this kind of uh, uh, like tech agnostic model, especially uh, back in two thousand seven, uh, back in two thousand nineteen, uh, when uh, Yano, uh, Ingjie, Song, and Budo and Grant they organized the HGS special issue on Geo AI. Um, I think this paper is uh, very well written and uh, have a lot of citations. In the last session, they mentioned a moonshot of Geo AI, which is uh, can we develop an artificial GIS analysis that can pass a domain specific Turing test by 2013? I think this is uh, the optim uh, this uh, ultimate goal for the Geo AI domain. Well, um, at that time, we think maybe the 10, 10 years or even 20 years to achieve this goal. But when this ChatGPT kind of system comes, this um, make us realize maybe the the realization for such kind of geo uh, analytical uh, agency, artificial agency, maybe will come earlier than we think. So this is on positive side, but for the negative side, um, I can speak from several aspect. For example, from the uh, society perspective, uh, as Yano mentioned in the introduction uh, slides. Um, so the foundation model, uh, the impact is not a one way street. So it's like in a circle. It's also will train how human thinks. If um, as we have discussed, there is a lot of bias in the model. So when people using this kind of model, it actually will reinforce a lot of bias, which is already embedded in a lot of the society domain, which will actually enforce on and maybe increase uh, uh, the bias in a large extent. So and also um, this will risk a lot of uh, privacy concern as we see from the uh, Latin talks. Um, for my personal experience, because as a sitting professor, your job is to do research and teaching. So I think for research side, um, there is a lot of things we, we need to think about because not only for, for our domain, but for the uh, whole AI domain as, uh, as a large extent. Now, when the foundation model comes, it means it is hard to train a model and it's hard to publish papers because every time, um, my friends, a lot of AI researchers said, when the, this kind of GPT-4 model comes, then all the reviewers will ask you to compare with this large language model when you try to publish this, which may essentially make your publication or research even harder. So how do you find a way to um, make, your uh, make your model or make your research more exciting and you should not competing with this large technology team with the capable of a large training machines and so on and so forth. And it's also make it impossible to, you don't have the infrastructure to train this kind of big model. So how do you handle this kind of situation? For teaching, actually I noticed uh, uh, Ray also mentioned it's an education problem uh, with respect to the foundation model. So um, education or teaching is also a very important or critical issue right now, because um, when we teach programming class, we expect students to write their own code. But when the ChatGPT can help us to write code, how do you, how do we realize or how do we allow students forbid the student to use these kind of tools? Or sometimes, uh, how do we design the regularities for this kind of uh, 
using this foundation model in the education purpose. Um, for the uh, for the geography domain, for example, if we can develop this uh, natural language interface to use ArcGIS, that's good. But uh, that's also diminishes the meanings of what will be a GIS, uh, GIS analysis will do. So that means uh, everyone, uh, if they can speak English or speak other languages, they can control the ArcGIS to do so. Then what will be the role of GIS analysis in the future? Yeah. Um, great. So I, I guess I'll finish. Um, I want to say that I come at these ideas uh, not as a scholar of technology per se, but a public policy and urban planning scholar. Um, so I really interpret this, are you frightened or excited for society, for the world? And I'm going to take a more pessimistic approach. I'm really worried. Um, and I'm worried for a few different reasons. One is misinformation and the potential to simplify aspects of life that are actually quite complex. Um, and the extent to which we can observe how it produces knowledge and decisions. Um, we have so much information at our fingertips, which is really powerful, but it becomes really hard to know what's real versus not, um, and to process all that information. And this has democratic implications. And um, we've seen the dangers of reducing or siloing the public sphere, think Fox News, Twitter, um, and we need public debate and a robust public sphere for society, for democracy, um, to make complex social decisions together. That's the democratic project. And I worry that, um, that these programs um, can harm this. Um, I'm also worried about helping my students become critical thinkers who can anticipate future uh, um, problems and solve future problems. And I worry that ChatGBT um, undermines their ability to operate as critical thinkers. Um, and as a tool, it seems poorly positioned to anticipate future events and think critically about social difference um, in the world. Um, and then finally, you know, we can't run controlled experiments in social settings. When you unleash something into the world, it changes the world, um, and it has complex effects. And so I think we should take a more precautionary, sensible approach here. Um, however, companies are not interested in social effects necessarily, and they're actually vested in the speed of innovation, um, because innovation involves competition. And so we see this rush to gain market power, which is really a rush to be first in the market, um, and I totally understand that. But this is counter to regulation um, to protect Society, and it's also counter to caution. Uh, we need time to understand what happens. And so I'm really worried at the speed of which, uh, at which this could happen. Um, and then I just want to say, you know, this push for efficiency and restructuring labor markets. In the U.S., we're not ready um, for this. Uh, we have a really weak social safety net. So if we see broader restructuring of the labor market, I'm worried about the consequences for workers. Thank you all for such great answers. Um, can I pick up on... Uh, what Giovanna was just saying, but maybe also link it in to what Piotr is saying. Because um, I think this issue about, um, you know, uh, Piotr, I think you said, you know, uh, helping people make rational decisions by overcoming a kind of an information deficit model. I think I heard you sort of talking along those lines. Um, and then, Giovanna, you were just talking about, you know, your students becoming critical thinkers. And, I, and I'm wondering, you know, I mean, we, we already have in place um, algorithmic um, technologies that can proffer um, solutions or uh, decisions. Uh, for example, um, you know, able to recommend whether someone... Um, is, is released on bail or not, or something like that, um, or whether uh, it, you know a, a judge uh, judges are using sort of automated systems to recommend sentences and so on. And is, isn't it the case? And this is this is perhaps more on the worry side um, <clears throat> that people tend to accept what a seemingly authoritative system uh, might might tell them because they lack the very kinds of critical thinking um, that, that Giovanna was alluding to, um, whether or not the system is, is uh, recommending a, a worthwhile or a helpful uh, recommendation or not. In other words, people are kind of susceptible to, to the authoritiveness of the system. I wonder if anybody wanted to pick up on that a little bit. Well, let me just uh, comment on what you just said. Uh, 
Yes, it, it, it's, this is a, it's been a problem. Uh, well, I'm speaking from the perspective of the uh, uh, North American U.S. educational system where we uh, have seen in the uh, primary school and uh, high school education, in many instances, uh, abandoning of uh, teaching critical thinking tools and the uh, capability to discern falsehood from truth. Um, and this is just going to become even more important down the road, that these, these skills uh, are taught uh, effectively. Otherwise, uh, uh, it's just our human nature that if something is easy, uh, in this instance, not only easy, but we become accustomed to trusting it, as the source of information and data, we basically default on that source. And we don't ask probing questions. We don't read between the lines. And so uh, this basically is a, you know, that, that, that touches on the broader issue of how we educate and what skills uh, people who go through the education system, uh, with which skills they leave that system. Uh, and it's also, uh, again, it has some uh, uh, affinity to another issue, and that is that I've been thinking about uh, these tools as they are. And even uh, looking into the future, assuming that they get better, more effective, still you know, will require certain skills to use them effectively. I mean, that is pretty obvious right now with what we have. Uh, let's, let's take part of chat GPT. To tease out of it useful answers, you have to be able to ask right questions and follow up questions. There is this whole profession of people right now <laughs> who are specialized in doing this. Uh, and uh, that may lead to, you know, this division in the society of, well, for the lack of a better word, uh, haves and have-nots, people who have those skills and are able to use these tools more effectively and therefore to improve their well-being, their position in the society, and those who do not and are being left behind. And uh, just like, you know, we've had this division on many different levels, income, education, et cetera, et cetera, this may be yet another dimension that may add to that divide. Um, you know, I'm glad we're coming back to this because I definitely wanted to go this idea of decision support and kind of helping people. It's, it's to me definitely not in the, uh, easy to do part of this big problem space, but it's the thing everybody wants to do. And, I, you know, I've spent my whole career thinking about how can we make complex analysis more approachable to people? Because, in my experience, people are bringing subject matter expertise about the problem that they're trying to solve often. And that is very difficult to have just as much subject matter expertise about the problem you want to solve as you do about, let's say, the algorithms that you want to, to use to solve that problem. Like having all of the things you need is difficult. And so making the methods as approachable as possible does put the tools in the hands of the people with the most subject matter expertise on the problem that they're trying to solve. And so I believe really strongly that there is a lot of, there can be a lot of benefit from, you know, these models eventually being better at, you know, I say, I want to solve this. I want to answer this question. What are the steps of the workflow that would allow me to do that from like a tool perspective? But that does still require a, a really um, kind of responsible user to ask the questions in the right way. I think that when it comes to kind of decision support, and I think it comes up in some of the question in some of the discussion um, in the last uh, panel as well, you know, there's the, the place with this, where this becomes the most challenging is the places where there aren't, there isn't a right answer, which is, I mean, for me personally, the majority of the questions I find interesting to, to work on are questions that don't have a right answer. There's a, there are wrong answers, but there's a lot of right answers and it depends on who you ask and what your perspective is. And so like, even when we think about like time not being linear and there being all these different 
ways that we can think about what's time and what's distance, like throw equity into the mix. It's like, okay, well, where do we put um, uh, COVID-19 testing sites so that everybody has, so that we minimize the distance for everybody? It's like, okay, well, is that really what we want to do? That's not really equity, right? And so how do we, how do we minimize the distance so that the people who will benefit from shorter distances have shorter distances and the people for whom distance really doesn't matter that much where there's less of a burden to have a 30 minute car ride have longer distances because the 30 minute car ride isn't that big a deal for somebody who has a car who has a flexible job you know and so we can't act like there isn't one answer to that question and it really depends on us forming very responsible questions that involve deep subject matter expertise like there isn't it's not magic, right? And so I think that from a what's our responsibility, where's our accountability, a part of that will be in continuing to help educate people about what those questions are that we can answer. And also my last kind of thought on this was in thinking about how we're training this next generation of models, I can, you know, a lot of, luckily we've all written beautiful research papers and documentation that we can see come back to us when we ask chat GBT questions. I can see sometimes my own voice come back to me because of things I've written a lot about. And that's really cool. One of the things that I think as a field, maybe we haven't done as good of a job of, and that is kind of a next thing in order to create the right training data for this is workflows, thought processes. That stuff in my experience is in the minds of our most, you know, our best analysts, our best spatial data scientists, and not very well documented in ways that a machine could learn from and then put back into the hands of people who would need them. And so I think that that's a really important kind of call to action for us is to think about how we document responsible analysis workflows so that they can make their way into these models and they can be used by the next generation of people asking these questions. Can I can I respond? I'm so fascinated by this. Um, and I want to say that even though I'm frightened, I, I still see a place for this in society, right? Um, I, I love kind of obsessed with Seth's catch-up analogy of like, it's great, but we don't put it on everything, right? Um, and how do we decide where to apply it? And I want to bring up that I saw, um, I think it was McKinsey is trying to think about how to apply this uh, AI to... Um, to insurance, um, I've seen it. Uh, we're talking about how to apply um, how to apply AI to markets, and when we have private firms driving this process, their goal is to get as much of the market share as possible. Let's apply it to everything, um, and I think that's really problematic. And um, I've been really influenced by Michael Sandel's book, "What Money Can't Buy: The Moral Limitations of Markets," and he brings up two points. And he says we should be worried about applying markets um, to all aspects of society. Um, and having private actors operating in all of these different spheres because it can create inequality. So think um, when we um, when we allow people to buy organs, the people with the most spending capacity can buy organs and other people can't. And that's a really problematic social outcome. Um, and secondly, he says it kind of changes our relationship um, with the act itself. And so when we um, enable trading of pollution or when we allow kids, uh, when we pay kids to get grades, it changes our act it changes our relationship with polluting, changes our relationship with the act of, of studying and all of these things. And so I think that I'm really worried about feeding aspects of life um, um, to market-driven models um, and to processes that kind of detach from democratic um, processes and spheres. That's not to say that there's not a role for it. Um, in society, but I think we need to collectively decide what that is. Um, and we need to ensure that firms aren't trying to move this into places like mortgage lending, um, because we've seen in urban planning, the deep and pervasive impact of inequitable outcomes around mortgage lending and how that, that just persists for decades. So, um, but, the, but these firms are gonna want it to apply to all aspects of life. So that's, I think my hot take, um, but to Lauren's point, absolutely there are implications. I, I would like to pick up what sort of like Giovanna was um, was saying in terms of, you know, you, we don't want to use this for everything. Um, these tools are, as I was saying, they're amazing, but they should be used 
for what they are good at, not for everything. So the, my, my opinion is that these tools will bring in a sort of like a, a sort of like a revolution, which might be similar to what the graphical user interface and later on the touchscreen broke in terms of interacting with the technology. Um, and they are amazing at sort of like allow somebody with, um, you know, very little understanding of a system to get somewhere without having to learn an entire system. But, and I, well, I, I don't think I can stress this enough. These things don't know anything. These things don't understand anything. These things don't reason. We are talking about large language models. They do not do any of this. And the smaller, the sort of like the, you know, let's call it smaller, the language is you trying to interact with them with, the more they make things up. Um, as soon as I start talking to ChatGPT in Italian and even more in my very small local language that ChatGPT uh, knows, uh, this more local language, the region I come from. ChatGPT knows this language, but it makes things up at the pace which is unbelievable. Um, and so these models, again, they should be used um, to allow us a new way to interact with this information. As Giovanna was saying, you know, we, we shouldn't be sort of like delegating, um, you know, decision making to these tools. Per, per se, I don't think there is very, very risky. Um, they just because they, they have no understanding of the world or, you know, and coming to policing and the examples that was mentioned before by Jeremy in terms of, um, you know, whether people have to go on bail or not, even much, much simpler models have been shown. I mean, these are the kind of things that are usually brought as a bad example of how to use machine learning. So yeah, I honestly don't think this should, uh, these are, this is the role of the models. Um, I think they can be used for, you know, imagination. They can be used to, you know, bring something up, to uh, create something that somebody um, would have maybe spent hours and hours doing um, in a, sort of like in a normal kind of situation, but they should not be used um, for generally speaking decision making in certain kind of situation just by default. That's a little, I think many of the criti critics of these models, the key point is not necessarily the models themselves, but the problem is that they are now portrayed as being the solution to effectively everything. That's one of the key problems. Uh, in terms of uh, how to responsible use this large language model or foundation models, um, there is some more, there is more like threatening example. For example, uh, in the Latin talk, we have uh, uh, presenters about talking about language chain. And now we have auto GPT. So basically the idea is um, you can use large, large language model to help you do something. For example, uh, you just ask them and they will help you to search online, search Google's and then download the files and then write some code to plot something. And uh, I even see online there's people so using say auto GPT to help them search on Amazon, uh, buy some stuff for them. Uh, but then that means you expose your credit card record to this large language model, which has raised a lot of privacy concerns, uh, which is uh, very, very, <laughs> um, very, very uh, short for me. Another example is, um, sorry, uh, so this is a, um, another example is a like medical example where you want to use all the GPT to see, oh, please see me uh, x-ray images uh, and then to detect what will be the possible disease I may have. And maybe they generate something if the user will not, without a good ad, educa uh, educated about this kind of concern, they will treat the diagnostic from the large language model as a truth. Well, they doesn't, they, because they don't know this is just a model generated result and not guaranteeing it is true. Um, 
I think all this uh, problem, uh, one important, um, I, I think it's not only for the foundation model for the general AI domain is uh, to increase the transparency or interpretabilities of the model. See, uh, like what we discussed in the previous panels, like what we need is uh, say, based what you generated, where did you generate the information? Did you get it from some web page? Uh, is this web page also read up by some expert? If you generate the images, do these images based on some existing image or training data set, or you interpolate between these images to generate some artifacts which no one have seen before? Um, and also like maybe grounding your uh, answers with some of the uh, information you we see in the current true database. This is uh, some way, at least uh, we should uh, push the community to do to help prevent all these misuse of the foundation models. Yeah, that, <clears throat> that's a lot to think about. Yeah, for, the, for that. Um, it's gonna switch to a little bit. We've got a bunch of questions in the Q and A and um, this was uh, similar. There's, there's one from Rui Zhu, which was similar to one I think we were going to get to hopefully. And they asked, can you comment on how foundation models would change our education in geography slash GI science? For example, how would ArcGIS be like with this new technology? Or we could add on, you know, what what would a PhD look like? Or even what would a, you know, what would the nature of a geography job uh, look like? I think all the things we've been talking about, um, sort of going going forward about critical thinking and so on, that's been raised as well. I think lowering is the idea panel is to answer this question. I mean, you know, I'm obviously I I can't speak to what's going to happen ten years from now. I think that you know it remi there's the, that there's that question it's also i see yano's question about what will the job of geographies be in 2033 if these models describe the world better than we may and when i think about my job as a geographer as a spatial data scientist i don't think my job is to describe the world i think my job is to help build what the future looks like and i think that there's no question that we have a really important role to play in that and hopefully even more important because of these models not less important i think that you know one of the things that Zhao fan said in the last session which i i think about a lot is like how what the model looks like and if we could build an ethical model and it's almost like you know there's this idea that all they all these models can possibly know is what has been and that's not what will be. Well, hopefully it's not what will be because what has been, <laughs> I don't know, feeling very bleak. And like the, what the, what can be has, there's a lot of potentials. And I think that this idea that we could build, a, I, I, I went off on this tangent in my head about this idea that we could build a model that looks like what we want the future to look like is kind of a, a really interesting idea um, that, that where the the result of of structural and systematic racism in our in our world are not there and we can envision what the future looks like differently is, is really powerful um, and something that I am personally really excited about and I think that um, that it will mean kind of this very thoughtful very, important role that we're going to have to play in thinking about how we make sure that the future is based on kind of humanity. And, and like one of the, the words that I keep saying a lot when I'm talking to people about this are humanity and empathy, because I think that those are the things that we bring as people to the, to the, um, to the situation. And, and it's something that, that is difficult to have in the, um, in these models and that I think that can't be understated the importance of it in making sure that we are part of designing the future, not just describing it. But even if we, uh, if I take, uh, you know, the mantle of devil's, devil's advocate and uh, assume that these models can create for us futures, certainly, you know, they can create not one, but many alternative futures. 
And so, uh, and that goes even at much lower level. Uh, they can create for us different designs. They've been shown actually to be quite effective in designing uh, various engineering uh, structures. Uh, so uh, let's say they can create for us different alternative outcomes, whatever these outcomes may be, then it is still a, a, a big role for an educator or education to teach how to evaluate these outcomes based on different values that we have, based on different preferences that we uh, may put uh, in front of these tools and uh, or with the you know standards that we can measure them according to so this type of evaluative skill which goes back to what i articulated before you know critical thinking uh, is a big part of education and i don't think that this will be taken away from us uh, even uh, way into the future when these tools get much better than they are right now so that's one aspect of uh, education that is very important. Uh, in, uh, you know, as my professor way back when used to tell me, you know, what is higher education good for? What is it meant to be? Well, it's meant to find information, to do something useful with this information, and then to critically discern what is important and what is not important. So, uh, I, I, in that sense, I, I think that we. Uh, here I'm not that pessimistic. I, I, I don't think that uh, this is going to really put us out of a job, so to speak, or supersede us as educators. But rather, uh, you know, it will open up some possibilities. And yet, yet I still don't know how, uh, how it, I can you know, seize these opportunities to the fullest. But I suspect that... Uh, it, it will be possible to use these tools to broaden uh, what we teach and to broaden what students learn and at the same time uh, uh, still leave us as humans in place in a central role. That's, that's perhaps a good place to leave it. I'm, I'm aware of the time and I don't want us to be um, uh, gonged off. Uh, as it were. <laughs> uh, well, I knew we would solve everything in 40 minutes, but no, of course we haven't. Um, so uh, for apologies to all the Q&A um, that we did not manage to turn our attention to. Uh, but again, just as a reminder, uh, please stick around um, in this space because I think Yano is going to provide a snapshot summary and maybe some pointers uh, for for future activities as well. So it just remains to me to, to thank all our panelists and uh, to the uh, organizers for, for hosting this event. Thank you very much.